excited to uh, to have uh, uh, Mark today with us. Um, I I don't know. I probably bought his book out of Amazon recommendation, and um, it usually takes me too long to read a book, but that uh, took only 24 hours. Uh, Mark has uh, you know several years of experience in uh, in retail. He runs his um, uh, own uh, firm. I'm just reading from uh, LinkedIn, markbelkington.net, consultants. Um, and uh, he has written an extraordinary book uh, about retail, uh, going very deeply uh, to the roots of the problem. But uh, more important, he, uh, he suggests some uh, really nice uh, solutions. So he's going to tell us how to survive the retail apocalypse, which is happening uh, right now. Mark, the uh, floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nick. Um, well, hello, everybody. Um, very excited to be with you here today. Um, what I want to talk about today is three things, uh, the retail crisis, the causes of the crisis, and then the rules of survival. So the crisis itself, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on, um, because I think we all know uh, what we're talking about. Um, there is a lot of stores closing uh, across Western retail. Um, if we look at the numbers, the numbers in, in 2017 were the were the worst ever, uh, with nearly 9,000 store closures in the US, um, which was higher than in the previous uh, peak in the Great Recession of 2008. Um, 2018 was slightly better uh, because I think of the tax cuts, but 2019 has actually started quite badly. So um, there's, there's quite substantial store closures. Um, there's been a lot of fairly major bankruptcies. Um, I'm not going to go through all the names here. I think you know them probably very well. Um, but uh, this, is, this is a lot. I mean, you normally get a few bankruptcies, particularly in recessions, but this is a, a lot of quite big names. And it's reckoned that around a third of malls, around 450 malls, may well close over the next few years. Um, there's a website called devmalls.com, which if you don't know it and you want to scare yourself, uh, go and have a look because... Uh, it's got a lot of malls on it. It tracks what's happening with the decline of these malls. And I think the key thing really that is uh, disturbing is that this is happening in a growth economy. I mean, GDP growth in 2018 was 3.5% in the US. Um, it's about the 10th year of GDP growth, which is a very long growth period. And I suppose the question I would, I would pose is, you know, if all of this is happening to retail in a growth economy, what, what could be the situation if the economy was in recession? Um, so, as I said, I don't want to dwell on that. I want to move immediately to the causes of the crisis because until we understand the causes, uh, we're not going to be able to define the solutions correctly. And in order to really look at the causes, uh, I'd like to start by going back a little bit in history and talking about what I, I call the classical retail model. And really retailing came into being after the Industrial Revolution because the Industrial Revolution uh, replaced handmade production with mass production of standardized products. And the, 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 the new mechanized factories were able to, to churn out this product in very, very large quantities. And this was fantastic for society, but it created a challenge which was the challenge of distribution. How could you get all of these products to consumers? And the answer to that was basically shops. So shops essentially were stock holding points close to where consumers lived, where uh, the products were fed through and the consumer could come and pick them up. And of course the consumer contributed to this process uh, by coming and picking up the goods and contributing their time and also their transport cost to get the goods to their homes. Now, the other thing that occurred when uh, the Industrial Revolution happened was that production was separated from consumption. When consumption was close to, a production was close to consumption, the people knew the craftspeople who had made the goods. But when it moved to factories a long way away, they had a problem of trust. How could they know whether this product was good or not? And the answer to that was brands. So factories started to stamp their brand names on products and invest in heavy advertising and large sales forces to sell their products to the, through the retailers to the consumer. 
Now, as the product moved down this supply chain from factories to brands to retailers and finally to the consumer, it built up cost because each of the middlemen in the process added a markup onto the uh, products. So the brands bought from the factories, marked up the products by two to three times to cover the costs of their sales forces and advertising. And retailers bought from the brands and marked up the products again by two to three times in order to cover the costs of their stores. So in the end, prices in the shops ended up being somewhere between six and eight times what they actually cost to produce. Now, consumers uh, paid those prices uh, for a few reasons. Firstly, they had limited choice. Really, their choice was a few uh, stores in their area. And uh, they also had limited information. And most of the information up until about 20 or 30 years ago, most of the information that people had about products actually came from the producers themselves. It came from the brands and the retailers through advertising, PR, and in-store recommendation. So the consumer was limited in information. Now, as retailing developed, it moved from the kind of serviced environment in this picture towards self-service. And uh, in recent times, in many, many store uh, uh, situations, the consumer has been more or less serving themselves um, because staff numbers have been limited by cost. Um, and so it has been a self-service environment. So that's become, if you like, the classical retailing model. Now, this goes on for 200 years or so. And then we have uh, a few changes that have uh, occurred. And I'm gonna list them all out. Uh, now, the first one is the e-commerce revolution, which I think is the one that everybody focuses on, but there are some others. But starting with e-commerce, e-commerce came along and provided an alternative way of moving goods from factories to consumers through the digital uh, channel. Now, in my view, e-commerce benefits from five fundamental advantages in this activity of moving goods from factories to consumers over shops. Now, this doesn't mean that shops don't have other advantages, but I just want to focus on this prime role of moving goods, distributing goods. And in the distri distribution of goods fulfillment, e-commerce enjoys, in my view, five advantages over shops. And that is what I call the five C's, which are cost, convenience, choice, control, and customer uh, relationships. So starting with costs, uh, the cost of stores varies, of course, quite widely, but as a percentage of retail sales, it can be, say, 30 to 40 percent of retail sales. Now, the pure cost of distributing from an e-commerce operation, not the marketing costs, but the distribution costs, tends to average around 8 to 12 percent of sales. So that's quite a big difference in terms of cost. And then what is often not uh, fully uh, focused on, I think, is all the stock duplication that occurs in retailing. Because with an e-commerce operation, you have one centralized stock, whereas with retailing, you have perhaps hundreds of stores all duplicating the same stock range. Turning to convenience, as stated earlier, the consumer contributed to the classical retail supply chain by showing up and, and, and picking up the goods. What e-commerce does, of course, is it brings it to people's houses. And that is a quite a big advantage, particularly in a society where people are very busy. And in fact, research among millennials in the US shows that uh, the, of all the preferences for e-commerce, the people who prefer e-commerce, the biggest reason cited is, uh, with 67% of them, is convenience. Now, thirdly, choice. Um, if you look at a, a big box store, uh, for example, in electronics, uh, Best Buy, if you go to a television department in Best Buy, it's one of the biggest, it has 80 options of television, which is a lot of televisions. But if you go on Amazon, they have over half a million options of television. So what you can display uh, online dwarfs what you can put within the four walls of the store. Fourthly, and I think this is something that is not focused upon, given that much of retail now is a fairly low service environment, essentially a self-service environment, E-commerce has a lot of advantages over retailing in terms of self-service. 
it has search engines which enable you to go pretty much directly to the product that you want as opposed to having to hunt through a large store um, when you get there the product information is very detailed and very clearly laid out in a standardized way whereas in the store often product information is actually lacking at that point of sale and thirdly in retailing around 15 percent of time the time in the us the product is out of stock uh, whereas because the stock is concentrated in one place in an e-commerce operation you've got a far higher chance of the product being in stock lastly uh, customer relationships now i know that retailers have done quite a lot of work of it on this in, re in recent years but if you take the classic standard retail model of up to 20 years ago it didn't really put that much emphasis on customer data or customer relationships. Um, the brands or the retailers would run advertising, people would come into stores, they'd buy things, and they'd go away without necessarily leaving a trace and not necessarily with their data being captured. But of course, e-commerce, building on what was done in mail order, has really specialized in customer relationship management, data analytics, and through that data analytics, a personalization of uh, their products and their services and this is a, this is added up to being a huge advantage now retailers have tried to respond to this but it's quite difficult when you've got one set of customer data going in through the website perhaps another one going in through social media and another one going in through the stores and that kind of centralized data management is, is quite hard to to create in that environment now armed with these advantages um, E-commerce has been growing extremely rapidly on a worldwide basis. Um, E-commerce uh, between 2014 and 17 grew by 72% per annum on a worldwide basis, whereas global retail sales only grew at 4% per annum. And the percentage that is taken by sales, e-commerce sales at the total, globally is around 10%, which may not sound that, that much. In the US, However, it's probably around 13%. In the UK, it's reached 20%. And in China, it's reached 25%. I don't think we know where it's going to end up. But the fact that some of these markets have reached 20 or 25% indicates that there is the potential for it to take over a very big chunk of the market. Now, e-commerce has come in two basic varieties. The most famous one that we're all aware of is what's known as the Amazon model, which is the online marketplace model, which essentially misses out the retail stage of the supply chain and offers a very wide range of brands and products um, at uh, slightly lower prices uh, than the standard retail price. And this of course has been extremely successful, but there is another model which I want to focus on a little bit today, which is called the direct consumer model, which is interesting because it misses out both the retail and what I would call the traditional brand stage. So what you're looking at is digitally vertical brands that buy from factories put together usually high quality ranges, and then sell them directly to the consumer um, without all the brand sales force or brand, much of the brand advertising costs and without the retail stage and are able to offer products, high quality products at very considerably lower prices than the traditional brand retail model. Now, that's e-commerce, that's well understood. What I think is less well understood is what I call the information revolution because the impact of technology on brands and retailing is not just about e-commerce, it's also about information. As mentioned earlier, the brands and retailers used to control the flow of information about products. However, that monopoly of information has been very considerably undermined by the development of the web, with social media, with the influencers, many of whom have got more power in terms of followers than traditional brands price comparison engines, um, peer-to-peer reviews, uh, like uh, Amazon reviews or Google reviews, and just social media friend-to-friend -friend recommendation. Now those are types of information that today's consumer, particularly younger consumers, actually trust more than they trust brands or retailers' uh, conventional advertising. And because that has broken the monopoly that they enjoyed over information, consumers now have a really, really easy way of discovering whether products are good or not. So this problem of trust that required this huge infrastructure of brands with their big advertising budgets is no longer necessary. And that means two things. It means that you could have the biggest brand in the world and it could have been established for hundreds of years. But if your product doesn't stack up 
consumers are going to know about it and they're going to talk about it. And conversely, you may be completely unknown, but if you have a fabulous product or a fabulous service that is very disruptive and really pleases consumers, that can go viral too. And that's been happening in a, a, a wide um, a variety of examples over recent years. The third area I want to focus on is what I call the generational revolution, because baby boomers who have dominated uh, consumer demand for the last 20 or 30 years are retiring and being replaced by millennials and Generation Z. And the big difference between millennials and Generation Z and previous generations is that they are much, much poorer. They grew up or came of age at the time of the Great Recession. They have missed out on the huge asset boom that has pushed out up the price of all assets like shares, stocks, bonds, property prices, pension valuations, art, everything has gone up massively, sometimes by tenfold whereas incomes simply have not. So for example, in major cities in the US, a house that would have cost somebody, a uh, young person in their 20s or early 30s, three to four times earnings in the 1990s, now costs 10 times average earnings. And that means that they simply don't have access to those kind of assets. They don't have secure jobs, they have to put up with the gig economy, uh, lean pensions, uh, unstable jobs, and they also can't afford housing. So a lot of people are living at home. More people are living at home in my country, in the UK, in their 20s and early 30s than at any stage since 1940. And that means a number of things. It means they haven't got the money to buy a lot of retail goods. They also don't have the space to store a lot of retail goods. And they are having to be very discerning about how they spend their money. And all this talk about millennials, you know, wanting experiences rather than goods is perhaps because they don't have the space to store a lot of goods. They don't have housing and they're not moving on with their lives. They're not getting married in the way that they used to. They're not having children as early as they used to. So this is a generation that is strapped for cash. And they are having to search hard to find new solutions that give them the standard of living that they desire. They're also, coincidentally, very, very tech savvy and very, very favorable towards web purchasing. And young people now uh, you know, are much less likely to shop in, in shops than they are online. If you look at the statistics on preference for online, it's inversely proportional to age. The older you are, the more likely you are to shop in shops. The younger you are, the more likely you are to shop online. Now, if you put all these changes together, you have what I call the brand revolution, which is that this combination of a newly poor younger consumer, who let's remember, retail really depends on younger consumers in many categories, uh, whether it's fashion or beauty or setting up home, uh, they're very important to, to retailers and brands. Now, these young people, they haven't got the money and they're being offered and targeted by cool new brands that offer uh, a, a better value for money because they're missing out these retail and branding stages of the supply chain. And these young consumers have responded by picking up new brands at a rate that has never been seen before in history. Because 20 or 30 years ago, if you wanted to launch a new brand, you had a 90% chance of failure because the high ground belonged to the established brands with their big budgets and their high brand awareness. That is no longer the case. There is a lot of distrust of big brands and there's a lot of preference for new brands. There's a lot of willingness to experiment. So the value of established big brands and established big retailers with their, with their um, long history is much less than it used to be. And it's possible for disruptors to come in to, to, uh, to the market. And if you look sector after sector, vertical after vertical, that's exactly what's happening. And then the final cause of, of the, the retail crisis is what I would call complacency within the retail industry. Uh, the retail industry uh, saw e-commerce come in the early 2000s. Uh, I think a lot of people thought that e-commerce was going to destroy retailing uh, at that time, but of course it didn't. And a lot of the dot-coms went bankrupt. And I think retailers then thought, well, that's fine. We'll keep our stores and we'll also have websites and we'll hire some people and we'll trade through both. 
But I think really the retail culture remain very heavily wedded to the stores and retailers still define themselves in their minds by their stores rather than the true source of, of, of commerce in their business, which is their customers. Uh, and retail culture is historically quite centralized and they were competing with new disruptive digital brands and startups that were much more, had a culture much more akin to the tech industry, much more democratic, much more fast moving, much more experimental. And this centralized slow moving culture, particularly with regard to uh, uh, IT, uh, products were given to large corporate IT departments uh, where they disappeared for a few years uh, and then reemerged after the market had moved on. So the, cult, the culture uh, and the failure to recognize as a threat of e-commerce uh, led retail to continue to expand and indeed expanded at a very fast rate, particularly in the US, even as e-commerce was emerging as a very serious threat. And as a consequence of that, uh, lack of investment, uh, um, inability to build large web businesses, most of the big retailers didn't build big, big uh, web businesses. Um, Amazon has been permitted to obtain uh, over 40% of the US online market. I believe now it's almost a half. These are figures uh, from uh, 2017, but the top seven retailers that had dominated the US in the 1990s had only got 11% of this very fast growing uh, channel uh, between them. So, you know, they didn't have uh, very large web businesses. And, uh, as the uh, technology revolution is continuing to uh, build, uh, we're going to see a number of new technologies that are going to further enhance the advantages of e-commerce. For example, if you look at this chart, top left, you've got uh, street robotics, you've got self-driving cars, you've got drones that are going to come along and reduce the cost of uh, delivering to the home on the final mile. Uh, you've got um, uh, computer uh, uh, controlled ports on doors uh, in buildings and apartments, which will make delivery much easier. Uh, you've got the whole development of mobile with uh, uh, iris recognition, thumbprint recognition, built in payment systems that are making uh, one click purchasing ever easier. You've got the development of voice activated assistance, which will mean you don't really have to um, uh, type anything in in order to buy things. You've got the development of artificial intelligence like this magic leap whale, which uh, is going to make buying on a website a lot closer, more realistic to buying in a store environment. You've got the development of big data, which of course is um, turbocharging all the customer relationship management, which is an area where the e-commerce companies tend to have an advantage. You've got the whole internet of things happening with smart devices like smart fridges, smart larders, uh, which is gonna do a lot of ordering of, of basic products automatically on a sort of um, order up to level without the consumer getting involved at all. And you've got things like digital, 3D digital printing, making manufacturing more flexible, which is allowing personalization. And again, this is an area where um, you know, the e-commerce companies uh, at their best tend to be quite advanced. So in summary, um, I see uh, retailing as uh, being like the Titanic. Um, it looks impressive uh, if you look at the big malls or the big stores, the big brands, but it is, in my view, hold below the waterline and gradually taking on water. And uh, we all know what happened to the Titanic in the end. Um, I think that we're you know, uh, it's overexpanded, it's overshot, it's going to go through a lot of restructuring, it already has, and unfortunately, as a high foot fixed cost business, retailing doesn't have to lose that much of its sales before, it only has to lose 10 to 15% of the, the top slice of sales before most stores, many stores start to, to be loss making. And then one is into a sort of death roll, potentially, of having to close large numbers of stores, um, take huge balance sheet write-offs, enormous damage to the brand in terms of the bad news in the media and uh, huge layoffs which create unsustainable pension liabilities that can uh, render uh, even major retailers uh, effectively worthless. And I, you know, I draw your attention to some of the big companies that have gone uh, under recently. Um, for example, uh, Toys R Us. Toys R Us uh, went bust 
uh, uh, with 15% uh, of the American toy market and with tens of millions of active customers. So it wasn't they didn't have a customer base. You'd have thought that they should have been able to make it work with that number of customers, but they couldn't because the channel that they had relied on, which was the shop channel, as opposed to the lower cost e-commerce channel, ended up being too costly to sustain the business. So, so much for the uh, rather bad, bad news elements of it. Let's move on to the bit we really want to know about, which is the rules for survival. These rules flow out of the analysis of the causes. So rule one, in my view, is to go with the flow, which is that if we strip out marketing or service elements and, and look at retail purely as a self-service method of moving stocking and distributing product, taking it from factories and getting it to consumers, which was its original function, that e-commerce is actually now a more efficient way to do this. Uh, it's got an advantage as a self-service uh, medium. Um, it's got uh, a lower cost fulfillment mechanism. It doesn't have all this stock out there in the stores. Uh, it doesn't have the cost of the stores. And it's got all these technology trends which we've talked about, which are favoring it. The second rule is cannibalize, cannibalize, cannibalize. Drive your own store customers online before somebody else does. We're all aware of the practice of showrooming, whereby customers come into the store, check out the product, get a product demonstration, try it, maybe try it on if it's clothing, and then go on their mobile phones and find the same thing or something similar uh, at lower cost and buy it online. This is happening everywhere. And my question is, you know, if some smart uh, market e-commerce marketplace or direct consumer brand is going to do this to you, they're going to, you know, they're going to take your customer away. Isn't it better that you cannibalize your own stores customer and get them onto your website before they depart forever onto somebody else's? Um, one of the things that is difficult to do in e-commerce businesses is to recruit new customers. And that's why it's so expensive to build e-commerce businesses. And the retailers themselves have found it very expensive to recruit new customers to their websites, which is why their website businesses are not that large. But it is actually uh, fairly easy to, to transfer customers from stores customers from the stores onto a website. All you have to do is to put lots of terminals in the stores. And when the customer comes with the product they want to buy, you say, well, I can either sell this to you at the retail price, which is say hundred dollars, or if you choose to sign up to my website and take delivery through my website operation within 24 hours free, uh, then I'll give it to you for say $80. Now that fairly small um, kind of discount, which you know, can be varied to, on a test basis to see what level of discount is necessary in order to, to flip large numbers of customers, um, uh, is actually uh, that sort of small discount is a fairly low recruitment cost compared with the pure cost of recruiting online. And once you've got the customer online, you've got a number of advantages. Number one, you can remarket to them uh, cheaply and easily uh, once you've got their details through your website operation, uh, because although it's very expensive to recruit new customers, the cost diminishes for remarketing because you can, you can, you've got their email, you can email them for free, and you've also got uh, a lot of information and data about their preferences, so you get a higher hit rate. <coughs> and there's a very good example in the UK, which is a clothing company called Next, which is really focused on this, and they've managed to get over 50% of their, of their business through their online business. So although their stores business is going down, I think 7% uh, per annum at the moment, the same as all the other retailers, their web business is growing 18% per annum, and because it's now 50% of their sales, they're able to succeed where many other retailers are failing. <clears throat> now, once you have started to educate your customers to buy online rather than always going to the stores or educating them to come in the stores, but to take delivery through the online channel <clears throat> rather than through the stores, then the role of your stores changes. They are no longer the places where all that stock sits and where all that stock moves through. 90% <coughs> of the space in most stores is used 
uh, for stockholding rather than customer interaction. Only about 10% on average is used for customer interaction. And so the actual cost of the stores, which of course is driven by the space, that space is actually driven largely by stock, not by customer interaction. And as we're all aware, much of that stock actually just sits there and doesn't move uh, through most of the season. And it has to be moved out forcibly through um, deep discounts at the end of the season. So, um, you know, there's an awful lot of very expensive space being used to house all of this stock. And the question is, how much of the stock, how much of the collection do you actually need sitting there physically in the store in, in order to operate your business? Because there's a lot of 80-20 things where 20% of the SKUs do 80% of the business. And with digital technology and the growth of artificial intelligence, it, it's become very, very um, effective and easy to demonstrate products um, on screens rather than necessarily having them physically present in the store. Uh, for example, with clothing, you can now show products uh, on the consumer, even if they're not physically present. And for many clothing stores, they're able to carry uh, um, a, a limited range of sizes, a limited range of colors, and demonstrate the other colors and sizes uh, technologically rather than having them physically present. So <clears throat> if you're not actually selling and moving all of your stock through the stores, it gives the opportunity uh, to do something that is absolutely necessary, uh, which is to create lean stores. Now, we've seen already that even a big business like Toys R Us were not able to sustain its millions of customers and its huge market share through its stores because the stores were just too big and too expensive. So this is not a kind of nice to have. This is really, really essential to try and align costs uh, with digital competitors. So basically, the role of stores changes. They become more brand recruitment points rather than what I call glorified uh, warehouses. Uh, there's interesting work being done on this um, in the home uh, market by IKEA, where they're opening smaller stores in city centres and they're using a lot of digital technology to demonstrate the products and to sit and work with customers on designing the kind of shape of um, uh, home that they want, the kind of products that they want. And of course, they have some products in the stores, but nothing like the range that they have in their out of town stores. And in other markets, I mean, this, this route was pioneered by... Uh, a menswear company called Bonobos, and they use their guide stores, what are known as guide stores, to, um, to fit the consumer, to really focus on the consumer with great service, get them into the right fit and the right types of fabrics, but actually not, not give them the stock from the store, which has really, really helped because it eliminates all the out of stocks, and it also means that the customer can walk away hands-free. So if stores aren't to be used uh, as uh, primarily places for uh, holding and distributing stock, what is their role? Uh, do they have a role? Well, the answer is yes, they do. Um, and that is what, what I would call to create brand theater. And this is to use stores to create unique experiences that the internet can't match. When you're in a store, you've got a three-dimensional environment. You've got the ability to woo the customer, to treat the customer in an excellent way, to have comfortable areas, and to have high-level staff like personal shoppers, to really focus on, uh, on customers. Now, what we've got at the moment, actually, is that over 50% of staff time is actually spent on menial tasks, not on customers at all. It's spent on moving that same stock around, booking it in, tagging it, laying it out, pricing it, repricing it, marking it down, marking it back up again, counting it, stopping people stealing it, and also other menial tasks like operating tills, uh, like cashing up at the end of the day um, and doing stock checks and things like that. So a lot of what they do at the moment is not focused really on customers. And a lot of those menial tasks are actually extremely hard work. Uh, anyone who's worked in stores knows how hard it is to do eight, 10, 12 hours in a store. It's backbreaking and a lot of it is because of the menial tasks. It isn't the customer service element that is exhausting. And uh, it means the combination of low wages and backbreaking work makes retail very unattractive for people. And as a consequence, people move on a lot. There's very high labor turnover. And that is not good for customer uh, service. And, and in this environment, you take out a lot of the stock movement and menial tasks, you can automate a lot of the menial tasks. And um, you can have fewer staff, but focus them 100% of the time on 
on customers and hopefully pay them a bit better and incent them better so that you can have people who are more akin to personal shoppers or perhaps out of work actors or actresses uh, that really give customers a fantastic experience, which is not at all, unfortunately, what they get today. Uh, now, brand theatre can also be created through, uh, through technology. I mean, Nike is a great example. They have basketball courts in their stores. They have a lot of technology that really creates a wow factor. Apple is a fantastic example where they, they use their stores to educate people about uh, technology from young, smart uh, tech people. Sephora is a great example where they've turned their stores into a sort of crossover salon environment with lots of makeovers and, lo and, lo and lots of you know, skin care sessions, uh, which really creates a very theatrical environment. Now, the other thing is that people are increasingly lonely. If you look at all the statistics, um, the, uh, the fact that people communicate through social media rather than meeting is actually creating a lot of depression and problems. And I don't believe in the future, although I believe in online, I don't believe that people are going to want to sit in their rooms and just uh, do, do everything over their mobile phone. I think people actually, man is a social animal and people actually want to go out and be in a buzzy environment with other people. And one of the things that brands have an opportunity to do is to uh, really work on their brand community. Um, to see their role, not as people who just sell goods, but people who actually gather together like-minded people uh, who have a shared enthusiasm for their product category. And there's some great examples of this. Um, Lululemon's a fantastic example. This picture is Lululemon holding yoga sessions in their stores. Great example where Lululemon represents empowerment, body, uh, body positivity, and uh, fitness and health. That's what they're selling to people. Rafa Cycling is a British cycling company which calls their stores clubhouses and they sell low cost membership of this club and all the cyclists meet in their stores and they give they have coffee houses, they give them free coffee and, and buns and they all sit and talk about cycling and plan trips together and uh, go off cycling together. And there's a great example which I love which is called Beers for Books which is a, it's a, it's a bookstore that if you bring your second hand books you trade them in for beer. And people sit and drink the beer and discuss the books. And it's like a book club where people are enjoying their shared love of, of, of literature in a social environment. These are great examples of people who've done what I call creating third spaces, uh, which is uh, clubhouses for brand community. Now, rule six is build the offer online. As we've seen, retailers are used to thinking of their offer being limited by the four walls of their stores. Now, once you go online, you don't really have any limitations. It's very, very cheap to add on uh, product display. Um, and this is highly recommended uh, to retailers in order to fill out their offer, fill gaps in their ranges and add ad adjacent segments. Um, and uh, great examples of this, uh, people at like Amazon, obviously, with their marketplace, which is now, uh, I think, a huge part of their business, where they don't actually stock the product, the designer will stock the product themselves. They rely on third party people to do it and to fulfill it. Walmart now is starting to copy the same formula and is building out its offer. And in the UK, Next, uh, who I referred to earlier, a clothing company, is doing the same thing. They're inviting other brands onto their website. They're starting to turn themselves into marketplaces. Now, the reason why this is a good idea, there are two reasons. Firstly, that the conversion rate online is directly proportional to the size of the offer. In other words, the more options you've got on the website, the higher your conversion is going to be. And the second key metric is your cost per delivery will be lower because the more options you've got, the larger your average basket size will tend to be, and therefore the lower uh, your delivery cost will be as a percentage of sales. Rule seven is ensure the price is right. We've talked a lot about the role of middlemen in the classic brand retail model. And really what the effect of technology is doing is, is squeezing out these middlemen from the system and connecting factories a lot more directly with consumers. Now, this uh, is something that I think is uh, quite long-term, but it is something that's really essential to understand, that it may be that people have certain preferences today for stores or for certain brands or whatever, but I believe that the size of this potential squeeze out of cost in the system is huge. I've estimated that if by going direct to the consumer with low cost direct to consumer brands, much of the market evolved to that model and away from the classic uh, brand 
to retail model, that the benefit to consumers worldwide would be of the order of $8 trillion. Now that is a huge prize that awaits the consumer. And let's remember that these younger consumers particularly are very, very cash strapped. So the combination of a cash strapped consumer and the ability of a new supply chain to deliver that kind of savings, I believe over the long term, is gonna squeeze costs out of the system. Now, what does this mean? It means looking at the whole supply chain, not just your own bit of it. So if you're a retailer, a big chunk of your cost is vested in your stores, in the size of your stores. So I've recommended that the retailers start to move towards leaner stores. That's a huge chunk of the cost. And the other thing that retailers need to do is really seriously consider or build their private label because they have to ask themselves in the question, is there going to be room in this new world for both the brands, the manufacturers, the wholesale brands, and the retailers in the system. And by cutting out the expensive branded product and moving, working directly with factories, they can, they can uh, cut a lot of cost out of their system. Now, if you're a brand, conversely, as your retail distribution base declines, it's gonna become essential to go directly to the consumer. And that's a very interesting issue for brands. So, rule seven is to ruthlessly eliminate stages and costs from your supply chain. Rule eight is really about product and about marketing, which has become the conversation. The problem with the traditional marketing route of, of buying large amounts of advertising and running it on TV or wherever, is that, the, 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 that consumers aren't really looking at that anymore. They're really on social media now. But conventional advertising doesn't work on social media very well. Most people flick straight past it. The only way that you can really get people's attention on social media is by having a good story. People use it to connect with their friends and, and they want to see interesting and new things. And the only way you can really do it is through innovation. You can't buy the consumer attention anymore. You've got to earn it. Now, examples of companies that really earned that attention, obviously the picture is of Steve Jobs with the iPhone. That's a classic example of a company that did a massive amount of disruption through innovation and became the conversation. Everyone was talking about Steve Jobs and the iPhone. Um, other examples are uh, these direct to consumer brands like Warby Parker in eyewear, Bonobos in menswear, Everlane in women's wear, Casper in mattresses, and away in the luggage sector. These are just a few examples of companies that have come in with a, uh, with a radical new product, much, much better value for money, and really disrupted the industries they've in, they're in. So you can't get consumers' attention just because you're a big brand anymore. You have to do something special. Another element of marketing is the way in which um, brands and retailers think about their, their brand. Because certainly 20, 30 years ago, it was very much command and control, which is centralized control of brand imagery. And you're, you're pretty much pushing that brand that you've come up with uh, to consumers. That doesn't work anymore because the interactive nature of the web means that consumers now expect to be more involved uh, with brands and to have brands listen to them more. And they also don't like having perfect images imposed upon them. Uh, there's a very good example, which is uh, in the uh, 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 intimate apparel sector, which is Victoria's Secrets versus a new brand called Airy, which is a disruptive brand. Victoria's Secrets has the perfect uh, supermodels, the angels in their with their seven foot height and their high heels and their jewel encrusted bras, um, you know, strutting out this image that women are being expected to conform to. Whereas Airy is, is saying, you know, we make all sizes, we make relaxed sports, comfortable bras. And their marketing is not through big fashion shows. Their marketing is all what they call hashtag Airy Real, which is their customers of all sizes, shapes and colors wearing their, their underwear on social media. And it creates a completely different vibe, which is much more attuned with the expectations and preferences of millennials and Generation Z, because they don't like having perfect images imposed upon them. The inclusivity is very, very important. I've said inclusive is the new exclusive, and customers these days expect to be involved in the design of the product, they expect to be given products to test, and as I said, they expect to use user-generated con content to do the marketing. They want to do the marketing themselves. If they love the product, they're going to fill themselves with the product and they're going to post it on their own social media sites. So it's a very different model of how the brand's going to operate. And linked to this, 
uh, brands need to create what I call virtuous reality, which is they need to have a higher purpose, both from a staffing point of view and from a customer point of view. You're not going to connect with millennials and Generation Z just by trying to sell them stuff. It doesn't work. They want to feel that what they're doing, the way they're living, makes some sort of contribution to society. Completely different uh, uh, zeitgeist from what we had with previous generations. So it's really, really important to make protecting the environment, um, being ethical and treating workers in the supply chain well, and giving back to society generally, really core to the activity of the company, um, and not just try and shift boxes of stuff. And the last rule is, is rule 11 is, is take the hack away which is that the retail and branding culture, which is highly centralized and top down command and control, isn't working anymore because the competition is not from brands and not from retailers, it's from tech companies. These disruptors, they're not primarily retailers or brands, they're primarily tech companies. The product or service they're selling is secondary. They, they approach all problems from a technology point of view. They uh, in, enable their people to uh, experiment and do A-B testing, on new methods, new products, new services, new promotional concepts. They let them be free to do it. Uh, they have hackathons and it's very, very fast moving. And the top down method is just not fast enough to be able to work. And, and companies really need to invest in having that culture and really invest in having very, very strong uh, technology. A good example of this is Walmart, which uh, bought jet.com, which was started by Mark Law. And Mark Law is, is uh, uh, a, a tech guru um, and they put him in charge of all their uh, online operations and he's revolutionized their, their on, online operations he's, he's, he's got them to grow he's also bought some of these direct to consumer brands he's brought in people they're incubate, incubating direct to consumer brands they're buying them and they're really really investing very very seriously uh, in technology and in the idea of the marketplace to really take on Amazon so they really have adopted very seriously this um, digital uh, uh, IT led approach uh, and other retailers need to follow the same route. So in summary, there is a crisis in Western retailing and it is spreading. It has multiple and complex causes which need to be fully understood prior to taking action. These changes add up in my view to the greatest change in the brand retail supply chain since the industrial revolution. And in order to survive retailers and brands need to make fundamental changes and don't get caught up in the details and miss the big picture. The good news is there are these 11 rules for survival. If you want to take a photo of the screen, this is the one to take. Um, these are the rules. I'm not going to go through them again. Um, if you're a retailer, the fundamental thought I want to leave you with is that the internet channel is a lower cost, more efficient self-service channel for doing fulfillment of goods to, from factories to consumers and managing data about customers and remarketing to customers. Stores, however, have a massive potential advantage from marketing, uh, from a customer recruitment and uh, community, brand community and service point of view. And that's the way to think about your business. My book, if you want to know more, is £20. Uh, so I suppose not that much more dollars these days. Um, there's a special offer on Bloomsbury, uh, my publisher, 30%, which means it's £14. There's the code if you want to take the photograph of the code, code retail 30 if you want to know more. Thank you very much. Welcome. Thank you so much, uh, Mark, for this uh, amazing talk. I just wanted to add here that uh, all the points that you made are uh, very well justified with numbers in the book. Uh, in fact, you know, you've been talking to, we are a technology company and, uh, you know, we like numbers. And every time I read them, uh, I get even more uh, impressed. Uh, I believe that uh, rule number 11 is the rule that we really love uh, because, you know, you, you're addressing an audience of hackers, especially our uh, friends from, uh, from Home Depot. Um, and, uh, yeah, we, we do love this approach for going bottom up. So um, I don't know if anybody has uh, any questions for, uh, um, for Mark. Nick, Nick I, have, I have actually several, but maybe I can ask one. So, yes, yes. Mark, uh, yeah, you mentioned Toys R Us uh, a few times. Uh, Toys R Us used to be a client of ours. And uh, one observation uh, I, I've had, I don't know if the, your data sort of supports this, is that retailers who are private equity owned 
uh, seem to be on an accelerated timeline to failure, right? So the private equity model is I will buy you uh, by borrowing uh, money against your cash flow and then your cash flow services the debt. And so the ability for a retailer who's private equity owned to invest in its future is limited because a lot of its money is, uh, a lot of its profits are being used to pay down debt that a private equity firm used to buy it. Uh, do you have any thoughts on that? Is, is it, is it like, what's the chicken? What's the egg here? Uh, in the sense, is it that you're weak and then you get bought by private equity and so you were gonna die anyways, or is it that you're bought by private equity and you become weak and, uh, and then you die? Uh, no, I think you're, you, what you said is very accurate. Uh, I think that a lot of the um, top US retailers, I think a statistic about 50% of the, the top 200 retailers are actually in private equity hands. And I think that a lot of them bought into private uh, into retailing before the Great Recession of 2008-9. And uh, at that time, retailing was seen as an attractive target because it had a lot of assets, uh, physical assets uh, that could be leveraged, and it also had some very stable cash flows. Um, unfortunately, they then had the Great Recession, and uh, uh, by the time they recovered from that, they'd now been hit from you know during the early teens by uh, you know the growth of online, which is eaten into the business. And if you put together the sort of rather short-termist uh, operating model of private equity with a situation where, where the whole industry had to go through radical transformation in order to survive, building web operations, still investing in the stores, learning new skills, that was this kind of marriage made in hell, really. Um, I don't think it was intentional. I think it was, uh, you know, it was done with the, you know, with the sort of, um, with positive intent. Uh, but th that combination of timing um, really didn't work out. It really was pretty disastrous for, for the retailers. And it, it still is, it's still playing out. Do, do you have stats on what percentage of those logos that failed, retail logos like Toys R Us, uh, were private equity owned? Is it, is the, is it, is it the same prop proportion that are owned by private equity, like 20% or is the failure rate higher for, private equity owned retailers? Almost all the ones on that chart are private equity owned. I don't have okay. an exact, but it's gonna be well well north of 50%. Okay, yeah, that's really interesting that uh, you know, you're kind of signing your own death warrant if you kind of accept a transaction like that almost, so. <laughs> <laughs> are you, uh, just a quick uh, a second question, uh, are there segments of retail that you think are more immune to the dynamics you described? Uh, yes, uh, I think any high service, uh, really high service environment um, is, is, is more immune. So, you know, um, you know things like luxury, um, is, is, is better protected. I think where you've got a very complex product that needs a lot of explaining and demonstrating and working on, um, that then I think it's it's uh, better protected. Um, I mean, service environments like say restaurants, for example, although restaurants have been badly affected as well, um, you know, it, it is at the end of the day delivering a service. The, the, the higher the service component, I would say, the better protected the, the, the vertical is going to be. Uh, Mohammed, so, uh, sorry, sorry to interrupt, but, but there is a whole chapter actually in the book about Toys R Us and the role of private equities. And says Toys R Us employees were also denied severance when the company went back bankrupt. I'm angry, you said, I don't blame Toys R Us. You know, it's a wonderful company. I blame the private equity owners and the bankruptcy laws. So I'll just post it on, uh, on the Slack, but there's a whole chapter actually about private equities and Toys R Us in the book. All right. this, is, this is Rafael, I, I, have, I, I have a question as well. Um, Mark, fascinating presentation. I was thinking about two, two things that seem fundamentally almost um, existential threats in this transformation. Um, one, two, you alluded to both of them. One is the retail footprint in terms of number of stores and square footage per store. Um, and the DNA of the company is being very centralized and very old school. So I'm wondering, the first, given that a lot of that real estate may not be easily repurposed or, you know, store size, you know, it's not necessarily that, you know, you don't necessarily need 10 times the space to create a high service environment. Um, how much 
could a retail portfolio be the death knell of some of these brands, even if they try to transform just because they can't, you know, get rid of it soon enough. And the other piece would be, I find it very intriguing, maybe the acquisition route to get, um, to get sort of new retail DNA. Um, you cited a few examples of that. How, how much do you think a, a retailer can truly transform as opposed to try to take a shortcut and acquire um, a new age company? A lot depends on the state of its balance sheet, basically. I mean, if you're Walmart, you know, they're, they're, they're huge and they've got, a, they've got a very strong balance sheet. If you're Ikea, they're huge and they've, and they've got a very strong balance sheet. So obviously how much cash you've got and how much debt you've got makes a huge difference. You're quite right that a big chunk of Western retail is effectively now staring down the barrel of a shotgun. Um, and people are coming in and having to, uh, to basically firefight rather than do the kind of long-term medium to long-term transformational process that, that is, you know, I discussed. Um, if you've got the resources and you've got the dedication and you start now, let me put it this way, you've got a better chance than by not. Um, so it's still worth doing. Um, and particularly, you know, this route of recruiting customers to a website, because let's just say you took a worst view scenario and you said, actually, my store's business is not going to be here in four years time, but I've got 10 million customers it would make a lot of sense to move them onto your website, your website where you've got a chance of being able to service them in the future in a much lower cost way, because you've already done the work of building the business. You've already, you're not like a dot com startup that's going to necessarily lose money for years. You've already got a huge established customer base and trust brand trust, but it's just, it's just, you know, in my view, and this brings me on to the second half of the question is that people are wedded to their stores. Retailers are in love with their stores. 30 years ago, I worked in manufacturing and the people in manufacturing were in love with their factories. And they didn't understand the factories were just a means to an end of servicing their customer base. And therefore they protected their factories until the factories went bankrupt because of low cost Chinese competition. This is the same thing. People are in love with their stores and they can't see that their customer base is what's important. And if there's a lower cost, way a more efficient way of connecting with their customers they should be taking that way it's not about the stores the stores are just a means to an end if you could transfer all those customers online you'd have a business and you wouldn't have all that cost so i think i think that the you know it's actually my view is that it could be relatively rapid to transfer customers onto a website now whether they then come back and repurchase is all to do with how good a service you know lots of things how good your brand is how good your products are how good your service is how quick it is, how cheap it is, all the, all the things that drive internet businesses. But once you've got them, I mean, anyone in the internet business or mail order business will tell you the hardest thing to do is to recruit a customer in the first place. And after that, you can, you can harvest them and the, the lifetime value of that customer. So if you can get them online, you've got a chance. Even if your stores go, you still have a value proposition. You've still got a customer base. And you can sell, it, you know, even if you have to sell the online customer base, to another company, to another online company, they'll pay good money to have another 5 million users or something like that for 2 million, 3 million, 5 million users. That is worth a lot of money, you know? So I think, I think that it can be done relatively quickly. And then the cultural thing, you've got to buy it in. You can't graft it on, but the, it, but the impetus has got to come from the top and someone at the top the board has got to say, look, these are the, you know, going to bring these people in. You've got to listen to them. You've got to put them in charge and not lock them in a room and say, oh, you're the little boys and the big boys are the, are the people who run the stores. And that's what happened in retailers. The, the, the tech people were sort of shoved in a corner. I, I was talking to a retailer the other day and I asked them, I said, how many in your marketing department? And he said, hundred. I said, how many of them work on the, on the website and social media side of marketing? And he said, 10. I said, it's the wrong way around. You need 90 of them on, on the internet bit and just, get 10 people to somehow keep the stores running, you know? And he said, well, 90% of my business is stores, only 10% is online. I said, yeah, but in the future, that stores bit is not going to be the thing, you know, it's going to be the online thing. Oh, excellent. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, do we have any other questions? Uh, we're already a bit past time. Uh, anybody else has anything to ask? And, and you know, Mark again, the the rule number eleven is something that you know we do, you know, we do see a lot. 
this is uh, a challenge, not just in retail, in, in several places. You know. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I also wanted to mention that the book talks, book talks about other um, segments like entertainment and uh, rental cars and other stuff that have nothing to do with traditional uh, retail. Okay. Thank you, Mark. Uh, thank you, Mark. Again. We'll be we'll be uh, buying many copies of your book here and uh, distributing. <laughs> well, thank you very much. <laughs> the best advertisement. Thanks again. Okay. Well, Thanks. I'd love to work with you guys in the future. So you know, um, if you want me to come over and speak, or if you want me to talk to any other audiences, or you know, I mean, I'd love to get more questions from from your audiences and and you know because every time we get questions it you know we learn something so people come and say well my business is like this it's not like you're saying it's like this you know and then you think oh okay what about that business and do you know what i mean it's i'd really love yeah. to expose it to as many audiences as possible and just to have interactive learning really yeah i i agree we see this pattern where, where even with technology everyone every retailer thinks they're a snowflake and they're completely different you're talking about the same consumers, the same macro phenomena, yes. the same millennials, yes. the same, the same, the same. So, yeah. Yeah. All right. Thanks again. Cool. Thank you well, very much. Lo lovely to see you, man. Thank Have you. a good weekend. Bye bye. Nick, lovely to see you. Lovely to see you. And thanks very much again. All right. Cheers. Bye bye. Cheers.